Hi, just a brief disclaimer before you watch the following video. This video that's posted here was uh, uh, pre-recorded before Sunday, August 15th of 2021. And, uh, and I did something kind of tricky in it. <laughs> and because of that, and I don't want to spoil it for you, but because of that, let me just ask you uh, that when you watch this following video, that you watch it all the way to the end. Don't uh, make any judgments until you see all the way to the end. And that's really super important. So again, I'm not going to spoil the surprise for you, uh, but just saying as a disclaimer, watch the whole thing in not just a few couple minutes or else you might be slightly misled. So again, thanks for watching these videos and give us any feedback you might have about these or future videos of the teaching here at Main Street Church. Thanks a lot. Well, good morning. Uh, I wish I could be with all of you this morning, but uh, uh, that's not possible. So, uh, so here I am instead, just by video, and we're glad that you're together. And uh, I just have a few brief thoughts for today. You are the light of the world. Do you know that? So I'm thankful that God has placed you in the places he's placed you. You're also the salt of the earth. You bring saltiness. You bring flavor. So don't ever forget about the fact that God has placed you intentionally where he has placed you to be light, to be salt. So I'm thankful for you today. Maybe these comments today will help you in that uh, entire thing. By the way, before I move on, I'm in my trailer. Yeah, I'm in my travel trailer. <laughs> Dorothy and I uh, live here when we go away from home, but uh, we're in the travel trailer today, and it, which just reminds me to ask you if there's anyone who has some property that we can store our trailer on, that would, uh, that would be really helpful to us. So just getting that little advert aside. Before I go on with what I want to talk about today, I want to give you a little history uh, relative to our church. Back in back in 2012, we participated, um, well, we instigated <laughs> a lawsuit against our city. Uh, the reason we did that was because during that year, there was the open house of the, uh, the new temple in Brigham City, and we decided that we wanted to engage people who were, who were going to visit, you know, the, the open house, that month open house for the temple. We wanted to gauge them on issues about, about how the, the, uh, the Old Testament temple and what happened inside of it does not resemble what goes on inside the Mormon temple. So we were looking for just opportunities to engage in that conversation. And, uh, and we had hoped to be able to talk to people on the sidewalks as they queued up to go inside to visit the temple. Unfortunately, as we started to do that at the beginning of the open house month, uh, the city stopped us, told us it was illegal to talk to people on the sidewalks, on the public sidewalks around the temple. Um, and when we inquired further, they said it was a safety issue. Now, whether it was a safety issue or not, I, I ended up going directly to the mayor's office and sitting down with him and saying, look, this is just kind of crazy. We don't want to protest. And we have some friends coming in from out of town who want to engage also. We don't want to protest. We just want to engage people while they're thinking about temples. We'd like to give them more to think about on temples. So I engaged the mayor on it. He sort of blew me off. He said, you know, make a written request. I made a written request uh, and engaged the city manager at the time as well asking for us to have access to the sidewalks and basically to, to put aside this municipal code that they had just instigated in order to keep us off the sidewalks talking to people um, and ask them just to set it aside for the time of the open house. Uh, they denied that. And, uh, and then after they had denied that and we had a couple more discussions, uh, we ended up suing the city saying it was against First Amendment rights to disallow people from talking to one another on a public sidewalk. Well, the, on the in the 11th hour before it went to federal court in Salt Lake City, uh, we settled out of court for no monetary money at all, nothing at all. In fact, we for, forgoed, forwent the... Um, the $48 that had been put in, one, $1 for the 48 counts, 12 counts against four people. <laughs> we forgot that and said, we won't even collect that, you know. And, uh, and instead, they just decided not to, well, to take those municipal codes off the books for the remainder of the open house. And, uh, and we're fa thankful for that. But it left a bad taste in a lot of people's mouths that we would sue the city on First Amendment issues. But for us, it was more than just a First Amendment issue in principle. It was really about maintaining and preserving our opportunity to talk about who Jesus is in a context where people will be thinking about religious topics. And we felt that was just important to try and preserve by doing this. Subsequent to that, we found out that... Uh, that this same municipal code had been copied and pasted into 
the municipalities, the cities that had planned to have new temples opening in the next couple of years. It had been spread out as a, as a, as a tactic in which to keep the protesters out. That actually turned on its head as well, and a lot of those codes were taken out. So it was a good thing that we did that. But that was 2012 when that happened. The year later, a year later, uh, the city decided it was time to deprive us of our property as a church, and uh, and so they were they were beginning they were beginning to process an approach using eminent domain law to take our building. Of course, they would pay us for its street value of it, which was very small. Uh, commercial properties on streets like that, most of their value was in the property, not in the developed inside of the building. But anyway, they were going to take our property and we had no say in it. This is eminent domain law and cities can do that. When they feel that, the property is a, is a critical need for the well-being of the community. Well, what was the critical well-being for that property and us not being there? The critical well-being for, of the property was that we should become grass downtown. And that was the critical issue. Of course, I think, and I can't prove this, I think a lot of people in the city were still a little bit miffed about our taking them on about First Amendment issues and talking about Jesus on the sidewalks the year prior. Can't prove that, but um, suddenly they were having closed, closed, behind-door sessions, secret sessions of the city council, uh, excluding anyone else from being there to talk about how they would go out using eminent domain to take our building. This is 2013. Well, someone in the city council leaked that information because they thought it was wrong to be doing that. They leaked that information to the local newspaper. The local newspaper was somewhat alarmed by it. And, then, and an editor in the local newspaper, through channels, desperately tried to find me. And, uh, and he did through a couple of other connections. And then informed me, he says, I've got it on good, good advice that it turns out the city council is plotting eminent domain just to take your property and you won't have any say in it. We decided that we liked the, our opportunity to share the gospel downtown in Brigham City. And so we decided to fight that. And uh, we hired a lawyer well known in the state in eminent domain on the other side of the aisle. The guy who actually was used by the state to take property from people in order to build a new power line through the state. And uh, so we hired him on and he was our defense counsel and a well known name in eminent domain law. We sat across the table from the city council and their attorneys and discussed this on a very serious occasion. And uh, and in essence says that, uh, you know, you can't do this and think about what it's going to look like. Anyway, long story short, they did not take our property then. Uh, but ever since then, it's been their, their hope that we would just not be downtown. Not because what they wanted to replace us with downtown for the benefit of the citizens of uh, Brigham City, but because they just didn't like our presence downtown, I think. And the fact that we talk about a Jesus that's different than the Jesus that is so promoted in the local religious community. So that's some background on what I'm going to, what I really wanted to share today. And some of you may not know that background since that was now almost 10 years ago. So with that in mind, let me tell you what happened just this week. Just this week. Now, of course, you know, another piece of background that... Uh, that the, the church has not been on the internet for a couple of years now. Uh, and the reason for that is we somehow got our, uh, the church got its name on the national do not connect list. And, uh, and they yanked us off the internet. And then they also deprived us of any uh, broadband wireless or wireless services. We can't get on the internet as a church. We can't promote the gospel online. The website is gone. All of our all of our presence online is gone, and principally because the argument that was used, and this was just last year, uh, the the principle that was used was that we are promoting hate speech and disinformation, and fact checkers had looked into what we had put out there and decided it was all lies and hateful and disinformation. And curiously enough, I couldn't see this coming, but it was because we we openly endorse the literalness of Genesis 2 about the fact that God made man as male and female, as man and woman, and uh, and not as a spectrum of genders. And they use that as a basis of a, the hate speech attack that was brought on us last year. And, uh, and then we were taken off the internet just like that. Uh, it kind of shocked us. We thought we thought if that ever happened, it would be for something more like uh, 
and other moral issues like homosexuality or stuff like that. But no, it was the fact that we maintain that God only made two genders, male and female, according to Genesis 2, and we held our ground and we lost the internet. And then we have no internet access, either access or uh, or posting. I mean, that's just gone. And you all know about that. That happened last year. But, uh, you know, I guess, <laughs> a word to the wise, I guess we should have understood this might be possible when way back in the 2020 election, you remember that? Um, uh, all the private data carriers actually had the nerve to censor the sitting president of the United States. They censored him completely, took him, took him off the internet and their carriers altogether. And even alternative services that wanted to carry what he said <clears throat> were taken off, were not allowed to, to find uh, servers um, to post their stuff. I mean, we should have taken a clue when it seemed, it seemed publicly uh, uh, acceptable to actually censor the president of the United States. And while many people welcomed um, shutting down his voice, it seemed to pass so quickly that no one ever thought about the fact that censoring a sitting president might bode bad things for the future for those of us who also put messages on the internet that people don't like. Well, <clears throat> that's water under the bridge now, so here we are without internet and without any kind of presence to bring the gospel that way. But just this week, <clears throat> just this week. What happened is I got a letter from the city saying that our house was being taken in a foreclosure, a tax foreclosure thing, because we haven't paid our property taxes at my home for the last 10 years. Now, that's just patently false. We have paid our property taxes for the last 10 years, and and it's just false. And so when they said, well, can you provide some receipts for having paid your sale, your property taxes? I thought, well, no, because I pay my property taxes online and it comes out of my bank account and, and there you go. But now I don't have access to the internet myself either because I'm a hate speech person and I can't get access to my online bank account, which you know all banks went online two years ago and don't have physical presences. And so I couldn't find receipts for me having paid my tax bills. They weren't going to provide the receipts for me. I had no hard copy documentation that I had paid my property taxes. So this week, the city declared that our house had been foreclosed on for tax and, uh, and we had to vacate. And I don't know a way around this. I don't have any receipts for that. And at about the same time yesterday, uh, all of our utilities were turned off in our house. No power no water, which you know, you know, both of those come from city corporations, our power and our water come from city corporations. We still have gas to heat the house, but without electricity to run the furnace or some other things, it, the gas is kind of useless to us. So the house is unusable without water or electricity. So we moved into the trailer, which brings me back around to my original request. If you have property we can put our trailer on, I'd really appreciate it because now we can't even park it at our own house because, well, we don't even own the property our house sits on anymore. So there we go. In an electronic age, we can't prove having made payments. We don't have internet access to be able to access our online bank account that, could, that I could print those out from. The, the, the bank is unwilling and almost uncontactable by us. We can't get to them to be able to prove that we paid. And so the city has taken our house. They, they put chains across the front door and we don't have a home anymore. We don't have a home. We don't have the internet. All those things from the past. And this just transpired in just, a, just this last week. Just this last week. So, pray for me as we continue to share the gospel. I am as convinced as ever that it is indeed the solution to lonely and anxious hearts is the gospel of Jesus and the nearness of God. And we will persist in doing that very thing, even if we keep having access to everything we own and everything, every avenue we've had to be able to talk about it taken from us. We will persist anyway, and uh, you will too. And that's why I start off with saying, you are the light of the world You are the salt of the earth, as I am. 
And God has put us here in a dark time and in a tasteless time in order to bring light and flavor to a world that sits in darkness in the shadow of death. So as we approach now uh, the 4th of July here, I, uh, I bid you a great 4th of July. Pray for liberties in our country so that we will be able to continue to share the desperately needed news about who Jesus is. So as I close this off, and i got to get this off to the couriers pretty quickly so they can get it to your homes as you have house church uh, tomorrow. Uh, I'm running short on time for the couriers to come by and pick up the, the memory card. I wish you a, a great Independence Day this weekend. Uh, I, I bid you just the tremendous love of God himself, the nearness of God is my good, says the psalmist. And indeed, that's very true. And you live amongst the people who desperately need this information. So be salt, be light. So have a great July 4th, this wonderful year, 2025. Signing off, I'll see you next week. Wait, did he say 2025? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I've been spoofing you here. This is a videotape from four years from now, which uh, it's not, this is currently 2021, not 2025. But I wanted to give you a sense about the fact that the freedoms that we enjoy and the liberties that we enjoy in order to talk about who Jesus is and the answer to the, uh, the fundamental need of life, those liberties that we have <clears throat> are very fragile, and uh, and they may change in a heartbeat. And uh, we see it happen in different places. And if we think that the church and the message of the church is immune from this, yeah, we're not immune from this. This is more of an inevitability. The timing is what's really in question here. Now, the reason I bring this up isn't to make a political comment about the deteriorating liberties of our moment. That's really not it at all. What I wanted to do is to is to come back to the book of Acts, which we'll talk about again next week, because as we look at the book of Acts, they were in a very similar situation. I mean, come on, when when the book of Acts opens up, we are we are uh, days and then months from uh, the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And so the climate in Jerusalem and in that area was very antagonistic toward Christians. I mean, this and this movement grew by the thousands very quickly. That was just a huge threat to the religious authority. It was a, it was a threat to authority, period, that people would independently think that Jesus was the Messiah and follow him. So the atmosphere then is not too much different than the atmosphere now, except that to shut down the discussion, all they could do was, well arrest people and put them in jail and then tell them don't talk about Jesus anymore. And so indeed what you see in the book of Acts is is a record of civil disobedience, not for the purposes of making a statement about liberties. Heavens no, that's just not that important. But it's civil disobedience for the higher and greatest purpose of communicating the truth of the gospel and who Jesus really is. Is he indeed the Messiah? Is he the one that has invited us to life with him and nearness with him, the resurrected Jesus? This is radical news to that new world. And uh, almost everywhere it went, it meant with opposition. It meant with opposition. And, uh, and for the specific cases we know of the apostles that are documented in the book of Acts, uh, they were thrown in prison and some of them killed. James, the brother of John, was killed very early in the in the narrative of the book of Acts. This was a costly thing. So what I want to what I want to leave the message with you this morning, as we continue on in the book of Acts, I want to ask you, uh, what are you willing to lose to be able to communicate the gospel? Are you willing to lose your freedoms? Are you willing to lose your house? Are you willing to lose everything you own? Are you willing to be imprisoned, maybe beaten, maybe killed? Is anything in your life that important? And is the gospel and is the message, this truth we have, is that worth it? Because for the people in the book of Acts, never forget, it was a costly endeavor to be able to talk about who Jesus was. When we get to chapter 6, we'll see uh, the martyrdom of Stephen godly man, wonderful servant, and, uh, and who spoke boldly and with great truthfulness about the factuality of Jesus as the Messiah, the one promise from the Old Testament. And it cost him his life. 
And standing on the side was a young, very uh, aggressive and ambitious young Pharisee named Saul, named Saul, who oversaw uh, this this uh, uh, aggression against Christians. Who later on the Damascus Road was stopped by Jesus, and Jesus, in my paraphrase, says, "Saul, what are you doing?" Why are you persecuting me? And that guy became Paul. So even in the most oppressive of circumstances that we might find ourselves, where we want to be able to speak freely about the gospel, God can, God can work in the hearts of those who are bringing about our loss of liberty. So pray for our leaders. Pray for this time that we live in. And as we continue to read through in the book of Acts, remember, this was a very costly, but a very powerful and very necessary uh, dissemination of the truth about who Jesus is, not who was the cr- the truth about who Jesus is, and in this particular in this particular generation, especially in the millennial generation, and I have great I have a great heart for those in the millennial generation who seem to to wrestle with monumental tidal wave levels of anxiety and and loneliness and rapid rapid dizzying change. Uh, we, we need to be one to stay together in the midst of this dizzying tumult and remind ourselves that one thing is constant, and that's the truth about who Jesus is, and the truth about the fact that he invites us all into his presence, and the truth about the fact that he is the one and the one alone who brings abundant life to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. Is that worth communicating? Yeah. Is that worth losing everything? I'd like to say yes, but I don't think I'd be sure until it happens to me, until I'm living in my trailer full time. So anyway, sorry we couldn't be with you this week. We'll see you next week, God willing, and uh, read ahead in Acts as we see the reaction and the resistance to bringing the gospel to those who so need it. So I'll be with you next week. God bless you. You are the salt. You are the light in this clearly dark time. So we'll see you next week. God bless you. Bye.